Um, today's word comes from, um, from Paul as he speaks to the um, people in the church of Philippi. It's from Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 2 to 13. I plead with Yodia and I plead with sympathy to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, help these women since they have been contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me, and indeed you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever had a terrible, no good, rotten day? All well, the rest of you, boy, never have. Oh, you have? You, you admit it? Oh, that's good. Good admission. This is confession time. Um, we all have. We've all had days where it's just kind of like, man, can anything else go wrong? And sometimes they start off wrong. They start off kind of going, oh, gosh, what a way to start the day. You know it's going to be a rotten day when you wake up and your braces are locked together. It's a bad day. When the bird singing outside your window is a buzzard. When you turn on the news and you're, they are showing you emergency routes out of the city. When you walk into the office and your boss says, don't bother taking your coat off. When your twin sister forgot your birthday. There you go. When you put both contacts in the same eye, and when your income tax refund check bounces, think about it. It's not a good day. We all have days when it seems like, oh, gosh. But sometimes it's not just a day. Sometimes it's a week. Sometimes it's a month. Sometimes it seems like it goes on forever that I'm being stressed out over this, or I'm worrying about this, and I just can't seem to let it go. I know for, for my, myself, sometimes at night, I just can't stop thinking about it, and I can't sleep. You guys go through that? You just can't say, oh, Lord, clear my mind. I can't stop thinking about this. So what do we do with that? What do we do? when sleep is hard to come by, when worry seems to be consuming us. Let's look back at the Philippians 4 here. If you have your Bibles and you want to look at it. Look at verse 2. It begins with talking, this, this passage of beginning in 2, Paul is talking about these two women who have worked beside him in, in sharing the gospel and the ministry, along with Clement and others. And it seems like there is something going on between the two of them, some kind of tension. And because of that tension, Paul is saying he knows that this is going to affect the church. It's going to affect the ministry. It's going to affect how people relate with one another. 
And you know in your own experiences as I do that when two people are arguing and there's tension between them, it's everybody else tends to kind of do this, oh, this is awkward, (laughs) and you step away from it. Paul will say, no, let's step into this. Let's step into this and talk about how we can have peace in our lives, how we can take away tension in our lives. Um, And so he shares with the Philippian church um, some some great advice of of ways to to deal with worry and tension and instead um, place it upon God and work through our lives. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, First of all, thinking about what anxiety and worries do for us. Are they good for us? No. We seem to, um, to have all had this thing where something holds on to us and, and people around us know it. I heard the story of this one woman who was, she could not sleep at night because she was always afraid that there was a burglar downstairs uh, from their bedroom who was breaking into the house. And every night she had problems falling asleep. And finally, um, her husband heard something downstairs one, one night. And he walked down there, and sure enough, there was this, this thief, this burglar. And so he walked up to him, and he says, Hi there. I'm happy to meet you. Would you come upstairs with me and introduce yourself to my wife? She's been waiting 10 years to see you. We hold on to things. We hold on to, to worries that... We should have let go years ago. Anxiety and worrying. It's been said that they are like a rocking chair. It gives you plenty of things to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere, right? It keeps you active. It keeps your mind active, maybe too much. I've heard that the average person's anxiety can be described this way. 40% are things that will never happen. 30% are things about the past that cannot be changed. 12% are things about criticism by others, and most of those are untrue. 10% are about health, and we know that when we worry, our health gets what? Worse. And 8% are about real problems that will be faced and we need to deal with. So we think about all the things that we really should not be worrying about and just focus on the things that we should be then we can start having, getting a handle on this. So how do we turn our anxiety into peace? I think there's six steps that Paul talks about here in these passages. The first thing, if you look at uh, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Emphasizes it enough to say that he repeats it. Now, is that easy? Do we just going to say, hey, no problem, or like the song used to say, don't worry, be happy, right? Or, akuna matara, akuna matara, right? We just say, no worries for the rest of my, my days. Is it that easy? No, it's not. I remember a few months ago, I'm going to go, okay, my theme today will be akuna matara, you know? <laughs> I'm not going to worry about this. But we do have to deal with what comes our way. But maybe we can worry less and have less anxiety if we look at, one, look at life from the right perspective. Um, Maybe we need to look more on the positive of life instead of the negative. It is so easy to go into the negative. It is so easy to think about the bad things. It's so easy to talk with others about the bad things instead of the, the positives. I read a story about a, a monk who went into a monastery and took a, a, um, a vow of silence. And after 10 years of never speaking, his superior called him into, the, into his office and says, you can speak, what do you have to say? And the monk said, food, bad. That was it. 10 more years went by. Superior calls him into his office. What do you have to say? Bed, hard. Ten more years goes by, calls him in his office. What do you have to say? 
I quit. And the superior says, oh, it doesn't surprise me. All you've done is complain ever since you've been here. It's not fun. Life isn't good when all we do is complain. When we're always looking at the negative side. We can always find the negative, can't we? Let's strive to find the positive. Maybe we can worry less or have less anxiety if we focus on our inner attitudes instead of our outward circumstances. Anyone can be joyful in the good times, can't they? It's during the tough times. It's tougher to find joy and to share that with others. There was a guy in the third century who wrote this. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. It's a good statement. Does it describe me? Does it describe you? Maybe we can worry less or have less anxiety if we rejoice in our circumstances, not in our own circumstances, but in the circumstance we find us, ourselves within God's kingdom. May we need to focus on the Lord instead of ourselves. Focusing on ourselves, our, our attitudes, our moods, they can change not only day by day, but minute by minute. I think I've mentioned here before, just, just one negative word from someone or I might think that they're thinking something negative about myself, or a memory of where I have blown it, can change from a high, I can become very low. Why do I let that affect me so much? It should not. And yet I allow my emotions to be, to be affected in this way. Instead, God calls us to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto him. The one who not only created us and loves us, but has a life planned for us and wants good things to come into our lives. May I, my focus be on him instead of my inward, what I'm, I'm seeing is missing or something in myself. The second thing that Paul says is to let our gentleness be evident to all. Look at verse 5. We see the word gentleness. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. In this context, the, the word gentleness could mean um, yielded rights. So when we think about it in being yielded rights, let your yielded rights be known by all. It's more along the line of not just being nice, but giving up of myself that I might be concerned with others. That I, even though I deserve this, I give that up that I might deal with your concerns or your needs. It might be my belief, and I stay strong on it, but I don't put you down to hurt you. I raise you up and consider what ways I can help improve your life. Could it be that instead of living inside of our own self-righteousness, instead of our own, inside of our own pity, that I look outside of myself to what others that I can help? Mr. Rogers has been in the news lately, even though he died a number of years ago. There's been a book that came out recently. There's been a, uh, a documentary that came out recently and a movie uh, with Tom Hanks in it. And you hear about uh, the life of, of, of um, Mr. Roger, uh, Fred Rogers. He sought to help children live a kinder, a kinder, gentler life. 
And as a Presbyterian minister, he could see um, how he could do this best was, was having this, this program on, on TV. They say that he so cared for children, especially children that he was hoping to, to raise up and not put down, that they say that he, he rarely ate food on his program. Why? Because he knew that there were probably children who did not have enough food watching television. And he could not reach through that television glass to hand them food like he was eating. He could not offer that. So he would not eat himself in front of them. Are we willing to give up of ourselves for others that their life might be better? And think about when we do so, what do you think will happen to our worry and anxiety about ourselves? Look at um, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Basically, Paul says to turn our worries into prayers. You know that a worrier tends to die sooner than a non-worrier? They've actually done a report, they've done a study on this. John Hopkins University says it, it's true. We don't know why, but it's true. And I don't know if we don't know why. Could it be that we have been inwardly constructed by God in such a way that, that we are made by cell, by brain, by soul, to be, to, not me, that we could live a life that is, is not of fear and anxiety, but of faith in God. Could that be that that is the way that God made us? Maybe we need to give God our worries. Maybe at night, when we go to bed, we can give him the worries. As I say, he's up all night. Why not? You know, he can deal with it. I read about one family that, um, in order to live out this principle, they said, okay, we are going to covenant together that if we have a worry, we're going to write it down on a piece of paper, and, and we're going to put it in a bag. And they put this bag, and they put on it God. And they taped it up high on, a, uh, on the kitchen door. And they said, okay, this is the worry I'm giving over to you, God. And then if they started worrying about it again, they would have to break out a chair and climb up high and dig it out of the bag just to show themselves, hey, I gave this to God. Why am I taking it back? It doesn't mean that we don't work on the things we need to work on. It doesn't mean that, that we, we're just going to go back and going, well, who cares? But we give the worry to God and let him deal with it. Next, Paul says to consider our thoughts, what we are putting into our minds. Think about it. What do we put into our minds between TV and Internet, what's on our phones, what we are reading, the books we do, the conversations we're having, social media? What are we putting into our minds? What are, of all those things, are they helping us with our anxiety and worry? or they're making us focus on them even more. Look what Paul says. Paul says in verse 8, oops, I'm just it over, sorry. Put a page on top of my 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We think about thinking of these things instead of all this garbage that we put in. How will that affect our worry? How will that affect our ability to deal with the pressures outside of us? I read about a thing called a bathysphere. A bathysphere. B a t h y s p h e r e. Ever heard of it? 
It was, in the, it was used in the 1930s. Consider a, a big old ball. And it was big enough for one or two people to get inside of it. It was made of, of metal, inches thick metal. And it was dropped by cable down into the depths of the sea where no submarine at that time could, could withstand the pressure. And there was a small window <clears throat> that they could see, a person could see out of, but also it was a very, very thick glass. And because of the, that thick shell, the people inside could deal with the pressure from without. But what they would see is they would see fish down there just swimming around. They didn't have this thick shell. They didn't have this thick, you know, metals protecting them. What's with that? And as scientists studied it, as, as what I read, is that the fish have a different way of dealing with that pressure. They didn't put on a thick skin. They let the pressure from within them balance the pressure from without. And so it is with us as Christians. If we have something within us to balance that pressure from without, then we're strong. Our tendency, though, is to put a shell around us, ourselves, isn't it? Our tendency is to, is to back off from people. Our tendency is to say, us, nobody else. And we do that as a person. We do that as a community. We do that as a church. We do it as a nation. We do it as a world. Where we look out for number one. Where instead, if we put this within ourselves that gives us strength, then we can affect our world in a positive way instead of backing off from it. Next, Paul says this. He says, follow peaceful, joyful Christians. In verse 9, he basically says, follow me. <laughs> Watch what I do. Learn from what you, you, you're seeing in me. And then do it. Who are we watching to be our, our heroes, our mentors? The ones that we say, I want to be like them. Are they people of, of, who exhibit God's joy? Are they exhibiting the, the anger and the worry and the anxiety of the world? Who is teaching us to live in a way that, that resembles the peace of God? Are we watching them? Are we learning from them? Are we seeking to be like them? In verses 10 to 12, Paul says to seek contentment. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have last renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were in concern, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is in to, be, to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. When we are not content, we feel like there's something missing in our lives, isn't it? There's some void. And we have this tendency to follow society and says, okay, fill it with possessions. Fill it with experiences. Let's get something bigger. Let's get something better. Let's get something more exciting in my life to take over this void because I'm not content. I've not learned to be content. I have to be better. I have to be more. And we follow that, that path. We, are never, we never find enough to fill that void. Only God can fill that void. In the 5th century, there was a man named Arrhenius. He wanted to, to live a holy life, so he left, he left his, his wealthy life and he, and he went to the desert to live in the desert to live a simple life. Yet when he would visit the great city of Alexandria, what would he do? He would walk through the marketplace of all the things he could buy. And people asked him, why do, why do you go back to the marketplace if you're living a simple life? 
He says, I find such joy in, in looking at all the things I don't need. Do you find joy in seeing the things that you don't need? Or do you worry about the things that you wish or you thought that your life needs to, to make you complete? Maybe we'll never really experience God's complete joy until we find contentedness in him. Otherwise, we're always trying to replace him. So what do you think? Good steps? I think so. I think Paul has some good things for us. And why would I preach on this? Because I have mastered this completely. No. I'm a fellow struggler. I deal with this every day. Every day I, I step back and go, okay, Lord, <laughs> drop those expectations. Help me to see what I have in you. Help me to see others and what I can do for them. Help me to look beyond my own worries. They might be very valid, but I give them over to you. How can we do that? Look at verse 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul says it's not through our strength, it's through his strength that we can do this. And why should we put out the effort to do this? Why should we seek after God's peace? Consider the alternative. You probably have experienced in your, this in your life. I know I have. Because when we are not seeking God's peace, we find that the alternative is that when the burdens and problems of life come into our ways, we tend to step back into our pain. And we don't want to deal with people. We don't even want to deal with God. And we step back and put a cocoon around ourselves to protect ourselves. And instead, God calls us to step forward into his light and to see that he offers us his peace, his strength, his love to deal with the pressures of, of, that we have every day. John 10.10 10 says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy I have come that they may have life and to have it to the full. Let's not let the thief steal the joy that God has for us. Let's not let the thief take away that which God has called us to live. Instead, let's turn to the one who gives us the abundant life in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you've come to set us free, and we are so grateful that you've come to set us free from sin, that we might have life now and for all eternity. And yet we ask you also to set us free from, from our worries and our anxieties that seem to cling to us, and yet really it's us holding on to them. We know we all have issues, we all have tough times that we go through and yet you call us to walk through those with you and in the midst of the tough times rejoice in your love Lord may my life may our lives be that which are of gentleness and goodness as we turn our worries over to you and, and, uh, and we focus on you and others sharing your love with them as well. May we know what it means to be content as you have placed us in this world to be yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.